what on earth is going to happen next? And because the prospects are not looking very bright, the Christadelphians have gone in all out effort in the past week or so to apprise the public of what the Bible says is going to develop before them in the next few months and years. It's very critical that we open up, we open up the Word of God and we have a look at it. It's not an antiquated book. It might have been written in antiquity but it's not an antiquated book. And we hope to show you that tonight. We have issues in this world that, that are global. We have global warming issues. We have global terrorism. We have global diseases that barely can be contained. We have violent drug wars in some countries. We have dozens of civil wars that are raging at this point in time in various countries of the world. And we have a very frightening shift, a very frightening shift in global alliances that those who watch the world scene see is very, very concerning. The Bible forecasts that what we've got before us, seeing the question is asked, what is going to happen next? The Bible does forecast far worse than what we see now, but that's before it gets better, a lot better. And you would have heard that tonight in the prayer of our chairman and the comments that our chairman made, that it's going to get a lot better than you see it today. But we have to come to grips with the fact that as the, as the God himself in the Bible has told us, he said this, that there's going to be a time of trouble, and we're going to come to this tonight, such as never was. A time of trouble such as never was since nations were formed on the earth. That's a quite telling statement. But for those who survive that time, and we can all survive that time together, is the promise of God. There is an unprecedented era of peace that's going to flood this earth like the waters cover the sea. Unprecedented time of tranquility for mankind for families and for nations on this earth and it's going to be a time that stretches a thousand years into the future and beyond. And it's known in the Bible as a period of time of the establishment of the kingdom of God on earth. It existed once before and that's why the Lord Jesus Christ played a great emphasis on it when he told his disciples that when you pray, I want you to ask the Father in the heavens, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If this is the first exposure that you've had to the Bible, I don't blame you coming here tonight uh, with a measure of scepticism. We want to try and remove some of that scepticism by the end of our hour together tonight. But we need to give you a little background to the Bible itself, seeing we're going to take it as a source of authority tonight. Who penned the Bible? How long ago was it penned? Let's just have a consideration of a few of these facts. So there you have, the Bible itself was in fact written by 40 different writers. They came from 10 different countries. They ranged all over the place. They came from Babylon, from the Iraq area. Uh, they wrote from Rome. Uh, they wrote from an island in the Aegean Sea, from Jerusalem and so forth in other places as well. And those words were penned. Some of them wrote from prison. But the first book, the first group of books was written 1500 B.C., Remarkable, isn't it? So when you pick up a Bible off your shelf, if in fact you have one and you take it off your shelf, you won't find any other book like it. It's absolutely unique. No other book will come near it as far as its antiquity is concerned. I've got books in my library at home and I sort of pride myself that some of them go back to 1680. You know, pick up the Bible and I've got a treasure in my hand that goes back three and a half thousand years. Three and a half thousand years. So Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy. 
Any of the Sunday school children down here can tell you the full 66 books that are in the scriptures. The last writer put down his pen and he was a very personal friend of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was the Apostle John and he wrote from, well the last writing, as a prisoner on the Isle of uh, Patmos in the Aegean Sea. And he wrote the book of Revelation, the, po- the Apocalypse. So he wrote that around AD 100. So the mathematicians amongst you know now that the Bible was written over a period of 1600 years. Somebody whispered it, of course. So it was written over a period of 1600 years. And when you look at the Bible and you pick it up in your hand, you've actually got sewn into the cover, you've got 66 books sewn into that cover. That's remarkable in its own right because you've got 40 writers, 66 books. A lot of them never knew one another, obviously, because you're talking about a 1600 year span and they weren't all in the same location. And yet, when you make it a life study, you will find, as you read through all of those books, you will find a grand theme that runs like a golden thread through the whole of those books. And that's the theme called the Gospel. And that Gospel has got to do with the establishment of that kingdom that Jesus Christ said you need to pray for, the kingdom established upon the earth and salvation that you might participate in that kingdom as one of the joint rulers with him. And that is the theme that runs all the way through the Scriptures. It also tells you about God and it tells you about man and how man can be elevated to be part of God. Quite a remarkable book, a remarkable subject is that as well. And so if you think about it now, this makes it even more uh, difficult for you if you came with a scepticism to accept that we're going to look tonight at these countries that are mentioned uh, on on the leaflet that was given out, Russia, Syria, Iran, Turkey and Israel, modern countries... And we're going to listen to a book that got finished 1,900 years ago. How's it going to talk about our days? Now that's what we want to just arrange with you to believe one thing for tonight. We want you to accept that this book is not written, its source and origin is not of man. I want you to put that as a foundation under what we're going to see tonight. I want you to accept that premise, that fundamental belief. I want you to accept what it claims itself to be. So let's have a look what it claims itself to be. In the second of Timothy we read these words. And that from a babe, says the Apostle Paul who wrote these words, You have known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise to salvation through faith in Christ Jesus and all Scripture is God-breathed. Your translation probably says it's inspired. uh, uh, In the Greek it would mean God breathed out what he wanted to be in that book and men took it and took it into themselves and so their pen was governed by what God breathed into them. And it's profitable, as the chairman said, for doctrine, for reproof, for correction of a person's life, for instruction in righteousness that we might be made truly furnished to all good works. The thing we want you to accept is this, that it's from God. The Apostle Peter, he also stated this. He said that we've got a more sure word of prophecy in the Bible and from it, even though there's a darkness in this world and a darkness in the minds of men, It's a very advisable place to go if you want light and if you want illumination. And it's not of any private interpretation. It's not by the will of men. You see, prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by God's power, the power known as the Holy Spirit. Just give you two examples of two men who experienced this. One of those was Jeremiah. Jeremiah said, he said uh, that he, he had the God of Israel speaking to him and he, so he was told, write all the words that I have spoken to you in a book. And look at the next verse. It's a bit to do with our subject, isn't it? 
For lo, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel and Judah, and I'll cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall possess it. You are a student of modern history. You know there's a nation called Israel. When I was born, it wasn't in existence. It is today. And Jeremiah was told, write this in a book, I'm going to do this. That's why we're anxious to tell you about the word of God. Another writer, King David himself, he says that God spoke by me. He said, the spirit of the Lord spoke by me and his word was in my tongue. So when David went forth and he spoke, he had the word of God coming forth from his lips. When he wrote, he had the word of God in his, in his pen. And so you'll read various things in regard to uh, that which is of, from God with the uh, King David. Now the invitation tonight that uh, we gave you said that we were going to talk to you about Russia, Syria, Iran, Turkey and Israel. I want to start not in that order but I just want to start with Syria because it's the current Middle East world, if you like, conflict because of the number of countries pouring in there to, to have their say at this time and it's brought about a horrific chaos for the people like you and I that were living there uh, relatively peaceful, peacefully although they were under an autocratic dictatorship which could mean that they would visit you at night and your family and your husband disappeared and you would never see him again. It was an authoritative regime. It had been so from the father of uh, Bashar Assad and, it, and it's been continued under him. So it's in chaos. Give you a sense of proportion of um, Syria. There's the map of Syria. Uh, you have Lebanon, you have bordering Israel, you have it bordering Jordan, you have it bordering Iraq, bordering Turkey. Now that country, as we see on the screen there, is only 80% the size of Victoria. Yet in it is the whole population of Australia, 23 million. Well they were there. In the last four years there's been many of them of course have been fleeing out of that place. And into this place have come all of these various nations, all of them intent on destroying one thing or another. And an absolute chaos has developed in there. Such a chaos that this continual bobbing that's going on, it's going on around the clock. It's been going on for years. The Americans have dropped at least 5,000 heavy bombs in the place. The Russians dropped the other day, within a three day period, one and a half thousand bombs. And they're continuing to do so. There are missiles being fired from one and a half thousand miles away from the Caspian Sea, from Russian warships, and they are bombing specific targets. To show off a little bit to the Americans in the sea, in the Mediterranean Sea, up came, popped out of the Mediterranean Sea from a, a Russian submarine missiles from there and lobbed into Syria. There was 235 Syrian civilians killed in that one raid. Now this bombing is relentless and because it's relentless this is the situation that is developing in the place. The place is, the place is becoming absolute chaos. This is also the, the, uh, the outskirts now of Damascus are suffering. The other, uh, other Homs and Aleppo have been suffering greatly as well and Damascus is, is suffering now. A little bit more to say about that in a moment. And so systematically this place is being absolutely devastated by world powers who are in there for some interest. Infrastructure. How do they ever get back to repairing all of this? How many billions and billions of dollars is required to bring back this people and this nation? This nation is going out of existence Half the population they ne don't live any longer in their location, in their homes. And half of that half are outside their own borders. Many of them never want to return to this place. And so it continues. A number of the cities are, out, are, are empty of people. Absolutely empty. It's horrific. And Assad with his barrel bombing, he's dropped thousands of these huge barrel bombs because he didn't have enough of the high-powered explosives to do and reap the damage that he wanted to do, 
he has got together and like 44 gallon drums of explosives and dropping them from helicopters on his own people and burying them in the rubble. So this is the situation. There's a numbed and a hopeless people that stare at the homes that were once theirs and the relatives that are buried beneath. It's a shocking situation. You know, the queues, you might have seen that photograph. The queues of people that are looking for the United Nations organisation to distribute food in this location. It's unimaginable and there's a quarter of a million of them dead. There's over a million that have been hospitalised and many without limbs. And there's 12 million displaced of the 23 million. Half of them are in the country, half of them are outside that country. Can I give you an idea uh, of the chaos? But first of all, before we do, you just look at this. There's 5 million, it's now 6. There's 6 million now outside the borders. Now this, this people here, when you look at this, they go back through there, back through this road, all the way back here, see the map there? There's an endless stream of people in a terrible suffering and they're looking for assistance and they're looking for help. And so they are desperate for aid. And here are all the women and the girls singled out here and they are on the run from their own homes. They're desperate. How many Syrians can you pack on a boat? And of course the dangers associated with that and they're drowning at sea. Reports came yesterday of some drowning off the Turkish coast in trying to escape the situation that they find themselves in. It is a terrible situation. They're displaced and they're homeless and the scale of the suffering, if you look at the extent of those tents, is unimaginable. They're vast tent cities that have been established to house a million people at a time. You know, the, United, the, the, the number of countries that are involved, including the United States, in that country have a lot to answer for. Let me tell you what the chaos is in that country. There's two wars there, isn't there? You know that there's a civil war and there is a, a war with ISIS. Two wars going on in parallel. That civil rebellion began back in 2011 and when Assad... He put the pressure on his people and he, and he killed a number of them who had, had risen up, part of the Arab Spring, to say we don't want a dictatorship anymore, we want to be able to vote for those that we want in power. Now he came down so heavy and so hard that the nation rebelled and even many of his army eventually left and became part of the Free Syrian Army. And then there was the invasion of the Islamic State people, the ISIL people, and they, in, they invaded because they want the, the, the part of Iraq and of Syria, they want a, an Islamic a caliphate established there under their rule of the law of the, of the Quran. And so the United States gets involved. It has an interest. It stitches together a coalition. And they fight ISIL from the air. And secretly the CIA, CIA arm the rebels that are fighting against Assad because they want him toppled. They want democracy. A spirit of madness is described, is democracy described in the Bible. Russia is in there against all that are against Assad. Iran is in there on the Russian side because they want to support Assad and they encouraged a few years ago the Hezbollah, who are the, the fighters in Lebanon that they were wanting to use to attack Israel, they've got them helped in there and they are aiding them with, with weapons and with money to fight for Assad. The Free Syrian Army is backed by the West and they fight, for, against, uh, 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 they fight against Assad. Now listen to this, Al-Qaeda. You remember Al-Qaeda, 9-11? brought down the towers, the world will never be the same, hasn't been. Well, that, those Al-Qaeda members could not put up with some of the, of the ruling uh, elite in the ISIL group and they separated out of them. 
And so they're in Iraq and they've set up the Al-Nusra Front. And guess who's financing them? The United States through the CIA. The enemy that they swore to remove from the earth, they are now in there because they are backing them because they want to topple Assad. And Turkey's in there supporting the Turkmen who are against Assad. Saudi Arabia in the Persian Gulf financed the Sudi extremist, extremist to topple Assad. The Kurds of northern Syria are in there fighting ISIL and because their towns are being invaded by that group they are very uh, successful fighters and they've been successful against the ISIL. They are backed by the United States of America but whenever they win Turkey bombs them. Chaos. Absolute chaos. The Kurds of northern Syria, we mentioned, there's Australia, Bahrain, Britain, Canada, France, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, United Arab Emirates and Germany bombing the place. It's like very much like a world war. And now Saudi Arabia yesterday announced a formation of a new 34 nation Islamic military alliance to fight in that country, ISIL. <coughs> while Russia continues to bomb whoever she feels is against Assad. That's the scene in the Middle East. It's horrific. And look, the, the, the UNHCR, the United Nations uh, High Council is it, uh, for Refugees, says this. Worldwide displacement is at the highest level ever recorded as war and persecution increase. There's over 60 million displaced people, half of whom are children. This is the global scale we see at the moment. We're witnessing a paradigm change, an unchecked slide into an era in which the scale of global forced displacement as well as the response required is now clearly dwarfing anything seen before. So we've got a worse situation since the last war. Every day last year on average 42,500 people became refugees on a daily basis. internally displaced and so they say it is terrifying it is terrifying there is seeming utter inability of the international community to work together to stop wars to build and preserve peace so there's United Nations paper tiger it cannot bring the situation under control and I want you to go back to one picture that we saw earlier on and I want you to recognise this this is very, very important. As Bible students, we have looked for years as to what this prophecy would mean as far as Damascus and Syria was concerned. Damas Syria has been, it's, it's mentioned way back in the Bible in the book of Genesis. Syria has been there for thousands of years, an arch enemy of Israel at many occasions. Damascus has been one of the longest uh, continuously ha inhabited cities of the world. And years ago, about 30 years ago, and I, went, I combed through the whole of the Bible to find every city, town, village, territory, nation, empire that God made a prophecy about and then go into the history books and find out whether it was fulfilled or not. And when we came with a group of young people to write up Damascus... Well, we couldn't, we said, well, it's got to be in the future sometime. Well, the future's here. Here's Damascus. And here's a burden against Damascus that is going to be taken away from being a city. It's going to be a heap of ruins. And the world is making sure that it's a heap of ruins right now. And that the, the fortress is going to cease from that place and the kingdom from Damascus is going to cease and the rest of Syria is going to be no more. Are they going to solve, by talking about, solve it by talking about it in January a little bit more? It doesn't seem so, does it? The fulfilment of that is underway. And so let's just return to uh, the other subject matter here. Let's deal with three of them together. Let's deal with Russia, Iran and Israel. Before we do, let's understand Mr Putin. 
Mr Putin has an ideology and a purpose that he states. He stated this back in 2005 that he wants Russia to return to its former glory. At that point in time he began to rearm with more modern weaponry and to build up ships, to build up new uh, weapons that some of which they say we haven't seen yet and he started that building it ten years ago. He's now starting to show them off in the Middle East. He's now able to jam the Americans so they don't want to fly over the area that was revealed the other day. And they're not sure how they're going to go in this cyber warfare. But that's his ideology and purpose. We read about him tonight in the book of, book of Ezekiel. What about Iran? Can I tell you a little bit about Iran? There's Iran. What's their stated aim and purpose that's important in life? Destroy Israel. Here's the man, Khamenei, who has written a book, 416 pages, dedicated to how he's going to go about the destruction of Israel. And our chairman, or our chairman didn't read it, but our brother read it tonight. He read Ezekiel 38. And there is Iran, known as Persia. And there is Russia, together. Russia guarding Persia. And there is little Israel. And an invasion is going to take place in the Middle East. So what we're seeing at the moment in that little country, 80% the size of Victoria, this Middle East problem is going to grow. It's going to grow to the point where it's going to be all nations are going to be gathered into that place. You start to see a semblance of it now. It is going to get better, at worse before it gets better. So you look at this uh, prophecy, Ezekiel 38, and you see what's going to happen next. So let's just have a look at it. <coughs> So son of man, this is the title for Ezekiel, he's told to set his face against Gog of the land of Magog, the chief ruler of Rosh. Now in your Bible it might not have that there, it might have chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. I've taken the opportunity to use the translation that broadens that out and tells us that it is a proper noun, a proper name. And we've done that because... Um, and there's the three countries we're talking about Rosh, Persia, which is Iran when I went to school I'd never heard of Iran I heard of Persia and then I watched with great intrigue reading my Time magazines back in 1979 and watched the overthrow of the Shah of Persia the Iranian revolution and the bringing together of the religious system the Ayatollahs that took over the country but it was Persia when I went to school and there's Israel now we said Rosh. Let's say, why do we say Rosh? Gesenius, who, hmm, I think he died earlier than that. 1642. I might have typed that wrong. Uh, you can correct me if you know. Uh, Gesenius, he was a uh, modern Hebrew scholar, modern in his time. Uh, he was one of the greatest scholars of the Hebrew language and he said that Rosh in Ezekiel was a proper noun identifying Russia. He says that Rosh in those locations is a proper noun of a northern nation mentioned with Meshach and Tubal, undoubtedly the Russians. So we have a prophecy here about an attack on Israel with Russia allied with other nations. And one of those allies that you see there is Persia. You see Ethiopia and you see Libya in there as well. And so you just need to watch the space of what's going on in the news so that you can see that there's going to be an involvement there uh, with Russia very soon. And so you have a date associated with this invasion of the Middle East. Now we read that invasion, we won't go back over it except maybe a couple of references. Um, we'll do that to maybe by looking at these. Look, here's the timing of the invasion. After many days thou shalt be visited, in the latter years thou shalt come back into the land that is brought back from the sword, that is gathered out of many peoples upon the mountains of Israel which have been a continual waste, but it is brought forth out of the peoples and they shall dwell securely, all of them. And it's an interesting situation, isn't it? Here's Russia, Rosh. Here's Iran, Libya, Ethiopia, involved in this coalition of nations. And there's other nations as well. There was Goma, which is the western part of Europe, which is predominantly France. 
Have they stitched up an agreement recently at all with Russia? Yes, to bomb ISIL. And they're in there as well. They're already becoming involved with Russia. And so you have here a situation where they're going to attack Israel and Israel is described as a people who have been gotten out of the the nations and they're going to dwell on the mountains of Israel and they're going to dwell securely, all of them. And there is Israel sitting there, very worried though at this point in time, with all of its military might. And yesterday the Americans said, we're going to give you another $3.5 billion worth of armament and munitions because we're a bit worried about your situation sitting where you're sitting. So they sit there with a security that they feel they have, a superiority they feel they have in electronic warfare and the backing of the United States, which they were concerned they were losing. But they have that arch enemy, Iran, that they believe is going to annihilate them with nuclear weapons and therefore they do everything in their power to prevent that to develop. This situation is in the Middle East, but what we're looking at here is the timing of it. It couldn't happen when I was born. It was going to happen after 1948. It had to be after the birth of the nation. And there is another reference later in that chapter at verse 11. I'm going to come against those that dwell at rest and dwell securely and I'm going to come into that land against the people that are gathered out of the nations, the Jewish people. And they were gathered out of the nations, weren't they, in 1948? Well, before that, Hitler had a plan to annihilate the Jewish people through the whole of Europe. He had a plan for his Third Reich, a control of the world. He annihilated six million Jewish people in the ovens of Europe and 27 months after his dead body burnt in the ashes of the Reichstag in Germany, there was in the world a nation called Israel. Remarkable, 27 months after the most massive destruction of those people in their history. And they were there. So this invasion mentioned in Ezekiel 38 had to be after 1948. And of course there's dozens of prophecies that talk about the people of Israel being gathered. Here we are. When I have gathered the house of Israel, says God, from the peoples among whom they are scattered and have been sanctified in them in the sight of the nations, then they shall dwell in their land that I have given to my servant Jacob and they shall dwell safely in it, shall build houses and plant vineyards. Yea, they shall dwell safely when I have executed judgments on all those who despise them all round about. They are surrounded by nations that have despised them. Recent times... Saudi Arabia and the nations that once paid to get rid of them are thinking they're a little bit of a blessing because we might have some security with this old enemy of ours against what they see developing in the Middle East. And so God says he was going to uh, bring them back into the land. I'll take you from the nations. I'll gather you out of the land. I'll gather you into your own land. And you'll dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. It can't be clearer, can it? Again, the scriptures tell us in Ezekiel 37, say, take, uh, uh, behold, I'll take the sons of Israel from among the nations, whither they be gone. I'll gather them on every side and I'll bring them into their own land. I'll make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel and there they are today. And then the next bit. Who died a cruel Roman crucifixion with a sign above his head Jesus of Nazareth the King of the Jews Jesus Christ is returning the latter half of that verse is yet to be fulfilled one king shall be king to them all today they pride themselves in a democracy but they're going to become a theocracy under the wisest, the kindest the greatest ruler the world has ever seen Uh, in our Lord Jesus Christ. And so you see these prophecies are coming to pass uh, in those last years and they had to happen after a certain period of time. Well, what about Turkey? Well, that's a little bit of a heading that shows you I just took those straight out Google News to show you that 
uh, Turkey is going to be in trouble with Russia, is in trouble with Russia. But I want to take you to the Bible and to show you now Turkey how they're going to be in trouble with Russia. Uh, it was forecast. Again, as Bible students, we have waited for these things to develop. Now you come over to Daniel chapter 11. You come over there and we'll look at just a few verses in Daniel 11. It's a remarkable, well, a remarkably detailed prophecy. One of the greatest prophecies in the Bible for its detail. We're going to just see if we can escape uh, a little bit tonight by just looking at a few of the verses uh, associated with it. Now we'll just skip over, there it is, to that there. Now if you want to you can look at, the, uh, at uh, chapter 11 and I want you to go first of all to the early verses here. Just so you get a context on this. So you look at verse, um, verse 2 of chapter 11. And now I will show thee the truth. So here we have an angel that's talking to Daniel and here we have uh, him saying, I'll show you what's going to happen in the future. Behold, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia. So bear in mind that Daniel was in Babylon. He had been taken away from his home city of Jerusalem. He had been dragged across there to, to uh, Babylon over in Iraq, the modern Iraq territory. And then they were invaded, that was the first world empire, and then they were invaded by that which became the second world empire, was the Medo-Persians. The angel says, as far as Persia was concerned, there shall stand up three kings in Persia, but the fourth one shall be far richer than them all, and by his strength and through his riches he shall stir up all against the realm of Greece. So now here, here comes Xerxes, he's the fourth king, we know this now from history, prophesied here before it had happened. The fourth king, Xerxes, yes, he was going to make prods at Greece against the realm of Grecia. And what would happen? A mighty king would rise up out of Grecia, Alexander the Great. And so he would rule with great dominion and do according to his will. And his dominion stretched right over to the river Indus as he overpowered the Persian kingdom. And when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken. Not much given to Alexander the Great. He would hate that. No, that was only that little bit there about him. Uh, very, very uh, you know, egotistical man, but brilliant as far as his uh, generalship was concerned of the, of the Grecian army. Uh, but he was the mighty king that shall stand up and he had these military exploits and he had brilliant manoeuvres against the, uh, the Persians and... So he brought into being the third world empire. The third world empire came into existence with its territory stretching right over the river Indus. Well in verse 4 uh, he dies and his kingdom shall be divided toward the four winds of heaven. He had four generals. They fought over it. They divided up the kingdom amongst themselves. There was going to be the four generals. We know that from history. It was not going to be his descendants or posterity we read there nor according to his dominion which he ruled, for his kingdom shall be plucked up even for others uh, besides those. So he dies at the age of 33. It seems as though he had a couple of children, but they were, one of them was born after he died, but none of those children survived the times. And therefore, as the prophecy says, the kingdom would be divided to the four winds of heaven. And his four generals took over and the trouble developed between the generals. Now we're in a little bit of advance of ourselves here and I did have a map and I've lost that map and I've deleted that map so you're going to have to listen and you know I think a lot of you what we're talking about. You know there's the Seleucid Kingdom that was established in the territory of Asia Minor and into the territory of uh, Syria and that went right across the west over into the, what was once the Persian territory. And then down in the south, one of the generals, Ptolemy, he established a kingdom down there in Egypt. And so develops in this chapter a problem between the general in the north and the general in the south. The general in the north gets called the king of the north. The general in the south gets called the king of the south. 
and a war goes on between them and the problem develops over centuries, over millennia and this chapter goes backwards and forwards, nor king of the north, fighting the king of the south. In the meantime, the little country of Israel in the middle is trampled up and down, up and down, up and down, Jerusalem and, 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 and that country is suffering as a result. And you know that because they're called the king of the north and the king of the south, that you'd only be calling that if you were in the centre and the king of the north and there was down in Egypt the king of the south. So this rages all the way through. Fifteen times the king of the north and the king of the south are mentioned in this location and you've noticed a couple of times but perhaps maybe verse 16 you'll pick it out that halfway through it mentions and he shall stand in the glorious land. Well that's the land in the centre. And why is it called the glorious land? Why would it be called the glorious land? Because it's the land where God had established the first kingdom on the earth that, and that during that time there was glory to him and his great and holy name in that location. Yes, it's translated the pleasant land, but it was a land that gave him the glory. When the Queen of Sheba came to visit Solomon, she gave greater claim to his God because of the fact of the happiness of his, his people and, and the realm that he was uh, ruling over. And so this goes backwards and forwards, the king of the north, king of the south, with the glorious land sitting in between, all the way through. We leave a few sections of it that we're going to talk about, but just arrive at verse 40. We come to verse 40. We come to an end. You see, this prophecy has got to be drawn to a conclusion. At the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots, with horsemen, mechanised army and with many ships and navy he shall enter into the glorious country shall overflow and pass over. So we're coming to the end. We've got now this territory that sits up there in the area of Syria and we've got this territory down in Egypt and now God says through the angel to Daniel there's going to be a point in time when all this up and down trampling over thousands of years I'm going to bring it to an end. At the time of the end. The king of the south shall push at him. Now if you followed the history all the way through, we never had time to develop it, you will find that at this point in time, Turkey was occupying the territory of Asia Minor and Syria and Palestine and in the First World War, joined an axis of countries against England and therefore England who occupied Egypt the king of the south pushed at Turkey and pushed them up out of the Palestine territory pushed them back up out of Syria and of course they've gone right back up into that Asia Minor section that they occupy today. You know Gallipoli, they couldn't win it, could they? Because they were pushing from the north. And Australian soldiers who survived the horrors of Gallipoli along with the, their British counterparts were, were loaded onto ships in the dark. They sailed out of that area, the north. They sailed down the Aegean Sea, across the Mediterranean, lobbed them in Egypt, got them on horseback, particularly the Australian light horse, and they went from the south and one of the greatest light horse charges, the last great cavalry charge it's known, happened when over three miles of territory these men galloped on their horses and they pushed back the Turkish army out of Beersheba, fascinating to go there and see the location where it all happened, pushed them out of that land, pushed them out of Jerusalem under Allenby in December 1917, pushed them out of that land altogether. The king of the south who was occupying Egypt at this period in history pushed at him and drove them out of that land. And as a result of that, because Britain felt they owed the Jewish people something, because uh, Wiseman, the brilliant chemist, the Jewish chemist, had helped develop and uh, synthesise TNT because Britain was running out of munitions, 
they said, we favour the Jews going back to the land that was the land of Palestine, the ancient land that their fathers were promised. And so the Jews came back into that land from that point. But you see what we're getting at here is that's all history now, but we want to know what's going to happen. What will happen next? Well, we got partway through that verse, didn't we? You see, we got to this point here. The king of the at, the at the time of the end shall the king of the south Britain push at him Turkey, and the king of the north shall come against him Turkey. <coughs> Russia just moved into the territory of the king of the north. Ezekiel 38 says they're going to come from the outermost parts of the north as well. Russia has assumed the territory. Russia is moving in there with tanks, with thousands of troops, building a second runway, coming in with all of the, 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 their best missile and anti-air uh, air, um, missiles. They're moving it all in and they're establishing themselves in a great way in the territory, the territory of the king of the north. So what's then going to happen? Well, the king of the north shall come against him, Turkey, like a whirlwind. And that was the reason for putting up there those headlines. Look, you know all about that. You know that that's developing. You know that the differences that are happening between these two strong men, Putin and Erdogan, and neither of them will give way. And you have this serious situation, even such that Turkey's had to swallow their pride and mend fences with Israel because they're going to need some gas and oil because Russia said you're not getting ours. And you think what happens with Russia then when, when, they, when Turkey gets it from now from Israel? I'll leave you to think what Mr Putin thinks about that. But what is he going to do? He's going to come against him like a whirlwind with chariots, with horsemen, with many ships. He's going to enter into the countries. He's going to overflow and pass over. He's going to enter into the glorious land, Israel. And many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape out of his hand. Even Edom and Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon, he shall stretch forth his hand upon the countries and the land of Egypt shall not escape. Isn't that interesting? They don't call it the king of the south anymore. There's no one occupying it. It's Egypt. See how accurate the Bible is? King of the south, king of the north, all the way through, all the way through, 15 times mentioned now. No, it's back in the hands. It's Egypt. And so we know it is Egypt today and Russia is going to come against Egypt as well. And he's going to have power over the riches of Egypt, which I think might yet be found. Keep an eye open on the papers. And the Libyans and the Ethiopians again, the same as Ezekiel 38, shall be at his steps. But he's going to come to his end. The tidings out of the east and out of the north trouble him. Therefore he goes forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make away many. There's tidings up from Jerusalem. There's tidings out in the Sinai desert that are interrupting him. He's going to make, an, a make a move to destroy and to utterly to make away many. And when he thinks he's been successful in Jerusalem, he's going to plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain, between the Dead Sea and the Mediterranean. As a great uh, show of strength, he's going to put his military uh, power and his, uh, and his headquarters slap bang in Jerusalem. Yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him at the end of that chapter. Why? What's happened there? How is it that, this is, that uh, he's going to come to his end and none are going to help him? Well, verse 1 of the following chapter flows on. And at that time shall Michael stand up. Michael means one like unto God. It's a title of one of the angels. It's a title assumed by Jesus Christ at his return. We know it from other parallel parts of the Bible. He shall stand up as the great prince which stands for the children of thy people and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to the same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found written in the book and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. You see the great promise of the Bible? The promise of salvation through a resurrection takes place at this time. This time of trouble such as never was. This time when Russia is going to come to its end as far as its military 
prowess and power is concerned. And then, of course, there's going to be a continual war that is going to develop over a 30-year period until such time as the nations are humbled and they submit to the regime of Jesus Christ. A regime of, of justice, proper judgment in the nations. And what about ourselves in these countries like ours where we, we sit as an island out in the sea We've got everything, haven't we? You look at those poor Syrians at this point in time. Well, let's just move on from there. There's the warning. There's a group of people that are dwelling carelessly in the islands, carelessly outside of this regime there and this, this area in the Middle East. Let's not dwell carelessly because, as God says here, they also are going to have the fires of judgment upon them. Wars shall not escape them either in these last times. But God is concentrating on the Middle East and on his promise that he made to the fathers of the Jewish nation. And so you have these words where it's going to concentrate on Jerusalem. It's going to become a concentration on Jerusalem. These people who are in Syria at this point in time, there's going to be a great concentration turned to who who's owns Jerusalem. Already the Russians are questioning the, uh, the ownership of the Golan Heights that Israel took from Syria, saying that it's illegal under the United Nations. And Israel is concerned. Well, what's going to happen is you're going to see in the next few months, you're going to see a tension turn to Jerusalem. And therefore, in the end, we're going to have a battle of all nations gathered together at Jerusalem. And so you have this terrible situation You'll have streams of Jewish people going out of their city, streaming down the Jordan Plains, across the River Jordan, as we're told in other parts of the Bible, down around the Dead Sea and up into the Valley of the Arnon in Jordan. So they're going to cop it. But look, God is going to go forth and fight against those nations like he fought for Israel in the times gone by. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives which is before Jerusalem and a great earthquake will happen. It's going to cleave in the midst. It's going to be the beginning of the end. We've come into the time of the end. Right? In 1917, we've nearly been 100 years, now we're going to come to the end. There's an end. What does it mean, the time of the end and the end? It means the end of the foolishness of the rule of the kingdoms of men. And God has put it out in the blueprint, in the timetable. It's all in this book. So the time of the end began in 1917, we were told in this verse. But there is an end. And we're coming to that end. And so we have this battle that takes place. As an ultimatum that goes out to the world, the kingdoms of this world have become now the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he's going to reign forever and ever. In Zechariah we, we learn in that day in chapter 14 and verse 9 that the Lord shall be king over all the earth in that day. We read also that everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem are going to go up to year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Because the God of heaven is setting up a kingdom, as you read there from the book of Daniel. And here, is the, here are the people that join with Jesus Christ in that day. They're described there as the people of the saints of the Most High, the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of that kingdom under the whole heaven. It's worldwide, it's global shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all dominions shall serve and obey him. The master plan that God has uh, for this earth. And you finally see these days where there's going to be established an unprecedented peace in all the earth. These are remarkable words from the book uh, of Micah. Absolutely remarkable words. You see... All people are going to flow to this new world order. A political establishment will be set up in uh, Jerusalem as well as a religious centre of worship, a vast temple. 
And nations are going to be uh, going to say, let's come up and go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths. You know, the Arabs are going to be there as well, as mentioned in Isaiah chapter 60. Now they go to Mecca, now they go to Medina, now they go to those places. They go there by their hundreds and hundreds of thousands. What you see here is a change from the counterfeit, the counterfeit to the real. This is what's going to happen in this day. And he's going to judge among the nations. He's going to rebuke strong nations afar off. He's going to beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. A reversal of what's happening in the earth today where 60 million people are employed in making munitions in the earth today. It's going to be turned on its head. And so it is that nations are not going to lift up sword against nations. They're not even going to practice war anymore. All the academies... Uh, for war are going to be closed. And so God is going to set up a kingdom on the earth. It's a remarkable transformation. So we've done that rather quickly. Russia, Syria, Iran, Turkey and Israel. What on earth will happen next? And we really do thank you for coming. We hope that you with us will be part of that remarkable transformation that's going to take place in the earth. And we hope that you're not as sceptical as when you first came tonight about this book. And we pray that we've left you an appetite to look at God's word even further. It's inspired. It's a book that is going to present to you the future and the great plan of salvation with which you can become involved. The Bible certainly is unique in all literature and it's unsurpassed in its inspired content.